Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to speak to you on a very simple subject and uh, we're going to be talking about the kingdom and we're going to, if I can get this thing to function, yeah, there we go, discovering your kingdom destiny. We're going to talk about that this morning. For those of you joining us by television around the world, may God bless you as we continue in our series on understanding the kingdom of God. And this is the gospel. We're going to be focusing on specifically today, discovering your destiny, which is the kingdom itself. Uh, we're going to be kind of zeroing on the fact that the kingdom is the original assignment of Jesus. The kingdom, the original assignment of Jesus. I believe that we have covered a lot of material already in this series, but the more I prepare myself to share this, the more I understand how off we have been as a global church. So I want to give you some thoughts to hang your hat on as we begin this segment of discovering your kingdom destiny. First of all, let's remember that the purpose for man's creation was really not to have a religion, but it was to carry out an assignment that God had from the beginning. And that is God's original purpose for man was to administrate a kingdom, not a religion. The last thing God wanted was a religion. Now he, uh, I don't know what this is we've made this thing into, but religion is a very dangerous thing because religion does not necessarily answer your questions of life. The word religion actually means to search. And we shouldn't be searching anymore if we found the answers. The second thing I want to remember is that the fall of man was the loss of a kingdom. Not the loss of heaven, but the loss of a kingdom. And the third principle I want you to remember is that the promise of redemption was to restore a kingdom. Whatever man lost, that's what God wanted to restore. So the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus was not to establish a religion on a worship experience and and the rituals and the traditions that we've developed that was not his goal his goal his purpose for coming his his assignment was to to restore the kingdom that was lost that man was given by God and then the other principle I want to remember is that the fulfillment of God's will is the re-establishment of his kingdom on earth and I want to stress that God's will will be fulfilled when what he intended to have is restored. So God's will is not for man to really be in heaven. I want you to follow the thoughts of these principles. God's really going to be fulfilled when man is on earth ruling and administrating his kingdom on earth that's God's fulfillment so until that happens God is not satisfied God is not fulfilled and the last principle I want to reiterate is that the program of salvation was to restore man to the kingdom government of God that was the program design uh, and I, I, I like the word program. I, I put the word program here because it has to do with, with systems and methods and techniques. A program has to do with goals laid out to accomplish an ultimate purpose. So the pro salvation is a program. Salvation is not the goal. Salvation is the program. Uh, when, I, when I use the term salvation, it includes all the redemptive acts of God. For example, uh, the promise of the Messiah is a part of the program. Then the fulfillment of that promise 
through Mary being conceived of the Spirit, the Word of God, and bringing forth a child born of miraculous birth. That's a part of the program. And then the child growing up and, and Jesus giving his life on the cross is a part of the program. Calvary is not the goal of God. Calvary is one of the goals in the program to ultimately accomplish the original and final purpose, which is what? To restore God's kingdom on earth. That is what God wants. So if you don't understand this, you're going to be stuck in a religion. If you don't understand this, you're going to literally live until you die and you'll use religion to keep you happy in poverty and depression and sadness until you die. In other words, you, you will use religion to be a pacifier rather than to be an overcoming power. I'm going to make a statement again and I don't want you to misunderstand me, but I mean what I say. And that is, Calvary is not the gospel. Calvary is a part of the program that takes us to the good news, which the gospel means, which is the kingdom of God. So I want to stress again a couple of things here. Number one, God creating you was to administrate a kingdom. You are created to be an administrator. An administrator is somebody who has been given the responsibility through delegated power and authority to execute decisions and judgment on behalf of another authority. If you've been given an administrative position, if you are a CEO or an executive administrator, or if you are a, a, a manager in a department of a company, you are an administrator. And what you've been given is delegated authority to oversee a specific area in the company. And your job is to execute the judgment of that company on behalf of the board or behalf of the chairman to carry out the will of that company in that department. That's what administration is. Is that clear? That's called dominating or influencing the department, dominion. And that's what God gave man. Genesis 1.26, very clear. God's first command to man, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let them have what? Administration power. Dominion over what? The territory called earth. So the department that man has been given authority over is all of earth. Not heaven, but earth. Now, if you've been given administrative authority over the department that deals with, with, let's say, correspondence, or maybe a mechanics, but you decide you want to go work in the accounts department, what do you call that? Huh? What do you call that? Mismanagement. You are moving out of your area of responsibility. You are actually illegal if you go into a accounts department and try to be an accountant if you've been given a job in another department. Well, the same thing is true of you if you go to heaven and try to take over. You are illegal in heaven. Sounds tough, doesn't it? See, religious people want to go to heaven, but kingdom people want to stay on earth because that's where they're supposed to be. As a matter of fact, uh, my boss said to me, by the way, his name is Yeshua Mashiach. He's the king, the Lord. He said to me, Father, do not take them out of the earth. Now, we pray to leave. He prayed for us to stay. Who's prayer going to get answered? I mean, doesn't he want us to come to heaven? Doesn't he want to be with him? I mean, wouldn't he really want us to be so we could sing forever and ever around the throne? That was not his purpose for you. He said, Father, do not take them out of the earth, but keep them from the evil in it. Why? Because they got the power to overcome that evil. Now, if you die, don't get me wrong. If you die, you'll go to heaven. No problem. If you die now, you'll go to heaven. If you're born again, you'll go to heaven. But that's not your permanent residence. If you read the Bible carefully, God got a program to get you out of heaven after you go there. If you read the Bible carefully, because you were not designed to be in heaven. That's not your final assignment. In the book of Revelation, the last chapter, 21 and 22, powerful chapters. And they, the, the book closed like this. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven. How do you explain that? Because you ain't going to stay there. God going to get you on an earth to rule if you got to make a new one. Clap. That's a good place to clap. Might as well get used to the idea. So God's plan is to reestablish the kingdom that Adam lost. Now, Adam did not fall from heaven. We talk about the fall all the time, but, but we keep forgetting where he fell from. Adam was not in heaven and he fell to earth. <laughs> so we got to take him back up to restore. No, Adam fell from authority over the earth. He had dominion over the garden and he was... He was uh, beguiled or tricked by 
uh, an unemployed cherub whose name was Lucifer. Lucifer tricked man and man therefore became subjected to this diabolical hideous evil angel and so the, the the management contract that Adam was given was actually handed over by Adam to this unemployed cherub so Adam is still the legal manager of earth and I say Adam I'm talking about you all mankind is Adam we are still the legal authorities here but the devil Satan Lucifer whatever you want to call him he has become the illegal ruler by subjugation of the legal ruler through treason what is treason treason is when you've been given a trust and you give it to somebody else Adam committed high treason he was given the trust by the government of God to run the earth and he took that contract and gave it to someone else and therefore he committed high treason and so the highest form of of, uh, of disappointment is treason because you've been given a trust and what did God do in the same chapter Genesis 3 when Adam gave the contract up is the same chapter that the government made a promise and the government of God made a promise in verse 15 it says and he was speaking to the diabolical angel he says that it's to Satan in verse 15 of chapter 3 of Genesis he says I promise you that the same woman that you use to destroy mankind's contract I'm gonna use a woman just like her and I'm gonna come back into the human race myself God says and I'm gonna crush your head and the word head is referring to authority you know we think of a snake Satan as a snake he's not a snake it's just that he used a snake's body originally in that chapter he possessed a, a, a snake body so he could have legal access but the head of a snake is how you kill the power of a snake isn't it yeah you cut a snake tail off he still lives so when God says I will come and my seed will crush your head he was talking about government power he was talking about the authority that that this evil creature stole from Adam he's I'm gonna take back the power and I'm gonna destroy your influence he's talking about government authority so what does God send Jesus for well according to Genesis 3 16 15 he was sending the Messiah the seed to bring the government of God back to earth can you please turn with me uh, to a couple of scriptures that we dealt with uh, before Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7 it says for unto us a child is born for unto us a son is given and the next statement says what and the government shall be upon his shoulders the reason for Christ coming was not to be a little baby laying in the manger like Santa Claus and reindeers no the purpose why he came was to bring what not a church not a religion not a tradition but the reason why he came was what not to sing songs clap hands and praise the Lord no he's coming to do what to bring a government on his shoulder the word shoulder here is referring to to the position that you carry something as a burden uh, in the days of Isaiah whenever you had a servant uh, they would put the, the, the wood across their, their necks and they would carry the burden to balance it it's like a yoke for a man and that's the way they carry they carry on their shoulders just like a cow they call it a, a yoke a yoke is what you put around the shoulders of a cow well humans also wore yokes in the days of Jesus and the days of Isaiah they would put buckets on both sides or whatever and they would balance it on their shoulders and that's where they carried the weight for someone else read it it says here for unto us a child is born yes he's coming the son is given that's the revelation and when he comes he's coming with some weight on his shoulder and what's the weight not a church not a religion not a tradition but he's bringing back to earth what say it loud I can't hear you say it again he's bringing back a government in other words the reason why he's coming is to restore a government that was lost the word dominion means to govern to rule to control to manage and to lead so when you say the Bible says let us make man and let him have what dominion the word dominion in the Hebrew means to govern to rule to control to manage to lead so he said let them have what government what did man lose he lost government what did Christ come to bring he came to bring back the government that means you were born to be a ruler tell your neighbor I like that sit up straight and act like a like a ruler come on some of y'all just smile and put your chest out 
I feel good, look good, smell good, because I believe I'm good. See, if you get this right in your head, you won't wake up Monday mornings wondering where you're going. If you are a governor, a ruler, and you are a leader and a manager, then no job controls you. You control the job. Your attitude changes when you understand why God sent you here to this planet, and that is to govern, to rule, and control. And Christ came to restore that government, and look what it says here. It says, it shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called what? Mighty Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I tell you, one of these days in this series, we're going to deal with this word peace. It's a powerful word, peace. Every time it talks about Jesus and talks about the kingdom, it talks about peace. Because peace means quiet confidence. Write that down. Very important word. Quiet confidence. Peace. Shalom. It means quiet confidence because of what? The knowledge of prosperity. In other words, you are quietly confident when you know that everything is covered by the government of God. Peace comes to you when you ain't got to worry about nothing. Even in the midst of a storm, you can go to sleep like Jesus because you are in the kingdom. The next statement says what? And of the increase of his government. This is deep. There shall be no end. Let me explain something to you very important. It says when Jesus comes, he's bringing a government. And when he brings it, I like this. God says, look. Oh, man. You all get this verse? You get it? Turn to the verse. Look at the last line in that whole, in that whole passage. It says what? And the zeal of the Lord shall do this. Isn't that great? Let me tell you why that statement is important. The zeal of the Lord. Now listen, God is God. God ain't afraid of nothing. God made everything. He owns everything. So he don't need to have zeal. Anybody here? No. Did you understand what I just said? Are you sure? Okay. See, you, you need zeal because you got to fight against some things. But God ain't got to fight against nothing. So he don't need no zeal. And yet the Bible says, the zeal of the Lord is going to make this happen. In other words, God says, look, if anybody gets in my way, I'll kill him. In, 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 in a way of what? In, the, in his way of increasing the government that his son is bringing. Let me tell you why that's important. Many of you are concerned about other religions growing around you. You're concerned about all the, the isms and the Islams and the Buddhism and the Confucianism and the, all this ism stuff. God says, look, the increase of my son's government, there will be no end to its increase. It's going to keep growing and growing and growing. And, and no, one gonna, no matter how they build mosques and how they build temples, and how they do, he said, don't worry about that. My government will keep on growing and growing. In other words, every, every every thought of the growth of any other group is temporary it's a good place to say amen y'all missed it y'all look at me like i'm crazy see i got confidence when i walk into into a country like malaysia or go to to timbuktu or if i walk into iran iraq i look at saddam hussein smile i say guess what you're on your way out why according to the promise god's zeal is against you you don't want God to get mad at you now, do you? <laughs> you know, God, does, God doesn't really fight. He doesn't fight. God created some, some creatures to fight for him. And they're some mean brothers. We're going to learn from them, about them right now. Some mean brothers. Those guys are so powerful. One of them poured one veil on the earth, the whole earth had a farming. One guy took one veil and poured out and the whole earth had a farming. He destroyed all the economies with one of these guys. Another guy came, poured a veil up, and all the oceans dried up. He just dried up. These are mean brothers. God don't fight. He made some guys who could fight. One of them showed up and wiped the economy of the earth out. Who are these guys? Some dangerous guys. The more I learn about them, the more I have peace at night. Because I thought they used to fight only for God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm getting excited by myself. That's okay. And he will reign on David's throne, referring to, of course, the throne line that God established. Notice he's going to reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it for how long? Forever. But justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness. I, 
Oh Lord, there's so much in this thing. Everybody say justice. justice. Write that word down, please. Don't pass these words quickly. It says that when Jesus comes to earth, son, he's bringing back to you your government that you lost, your power to rule the planet and to overcome your circumstances. Your tuition is paid by the kingdom of God. Now, if you try to pay it yourself, you're going to have heartache and depression and frustration. I went to college and spent $57,000 on my undergraduate degrees. And the Lord opened every door. I tell you, my parents didn't have to send me any money. Thank God. My sister right here started me off with one semester payment. That was it. Everything else God supplied. And for eight years of college and three, four, five degrees, God has been a good God. Why? Because I trusted the kingdom. It says here, justice. He shall uphold it with justice. Get the word justice down. The word justice means rights. R-I-G-H-T-S rights he's saying look when he comes he's going to restore the government of god he's going to restore the kingdom there it is of god and he's going to give every citizen their rights again that's what justice means it doesn't mean the judgment seat of god I'm not referring to that it's talking about rights that's why the word righteousness is next to it in other words, when you enter the kingdom of God, you no longer get anything from God because of the way you feel or the way he feels. You get it now because of your rights as a legal citizen entity. That's completely opposite to religion. Religion functions on emotions. It functions on appeasing. It functions on trying to please somebody. That's not rights. That word justice is what you find in courtrooms. And when you go to a court, you go there to get what is justly yours as a citizen. And when you go there to get justice, the judge doesn't care how you feel. He, re he deals with what? The law. And when you come in that courtroom, you better don't start crying and moping because he ain't into that. Matter of fact, if you start getting mushy, he tells you, we'll adjourn the court until you catch yourself and you come back. Why? Because justice has to do with law, has to do with rights, not how you feel. So praying all night and moaning and groaning and, and all that stuff doesn't move God if you don't come with the law. Your power as a citizen of the kingdom of God is in this book, in knowing the law of God. You know, when Jesus was, a, was, was confronted, oh man, this is so good, by Satan in the wilderness, remember that, for 40 days? How did he deal with that guy? He didn't get, you know, Lord, I rebuke you. <laughs> no, no, no. He says, look, it is written. Man, clap, man. Y'all ain't getting this yet. You don't deal with God and say, well, Lord, you know how I feel. I don't have no feeling. If you are a citizen and I am the government, you deal with me with law. If you got a need for healing, you better find some law to kick into the health system of the kingdom. Y'all better talk to me. If you got frustration, you better find some scripture, some law to kick in for peace of mind. If you've got some need for some prosperity, you better get to call them Jehovah Jireh and use some law to get Jireh to work for you. I'm preaching to myself, having a good time all by myself. I'll tell your neighbor, I'm a kingdom citizen. Let me tell you something. The last thing I want to be from now on is a religious Christian. I am not dying anymore. You Christians can be Christians. I'm going to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell you, neighbor, I have a right to be healed. You, you don't go to God and say, Lord, you know, I hurt. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You need to go there as a citizen. You told me that the government paid for my health program. You told me in the law that the stripes on the back of my king was to pay for my healing. So I am claiming my rights now. I got some problems in my body and I demand the government to kick in the health system. Praise the Lord, somebody. Remember blind Bartimus? He was blind, eh? Blind Bartimus was blind a long time. Go into the synagogue every Saturday. That means going to church blind every time. 
because I'm ministers who are in charge, them, them rabbis, and they, they don't know what to do with him. One day he heard that this man came to this town named Jesus. And do you know what he started saying? Let's read what he started saying. It says, And of the increase of his government, there will be no end, and he will reign on David's throne. Now, I believe Bartimus must have heard the scripture somewhere. So he didn't say Jesus. He said, Jesus, thou son of David. In other words, I'm quoting law now. Lord, have mercy. I understand you bought a government and I got a right to be healed. Christ heard this man in the crowd. There's a big crowd around Jesus, the Bible says. And when he heard the man, I mean, the man was blind. And Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, son of David. Christ heard son of David. He said, someone knows the law. Then he told the disciples, stop. They said, there's too many people. He said, find that man. There were a lot of blind people around in that town. There might have been many of them right there at the gate. But that's the only one who understood the law. So he got healed. And Christ healed him. Let me tell you something, friend. Listen carefully. Many people may be sick around you. I hope you're the one who gets healed. Healing is not contagious. You all better hear me. It has to do with who knows the law, the rights, the citizen rights. And that's why you can't just hang around religious people and think you can get well. You better know the law of God. You better know the kingdom government of God so you can get what's rightfully yours. He comes to bring what? Justice and righteousness. And let's take a look. Uh, what Jesus said himself eh? interesting words of Jesus Jesus said these words in Luke chapter 4 he said I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns because that is why I came I'm reiterating this because you see we've got to understand that we don't need to guess about why he came he tells us i want to read this again this verse needs to be inscribed on your mirror when you're fixing your face in the morning jesus said i must preach the good news what's the good news the word means gospel i must preach the gospel of what the kingdom, not of denomination, not of your religion, not of your traditions, not of all of your rituals, but I came to preach the good news of the kingdom. Can I suggest to you that, that, that there's only one good news? And it's what? The restoration of your authority over your circumstances, which is kingdom. Amen. The best news you could hear is that you can control your future again. Your number one problem right now is that everybody controls you. The bank owns you. The insurance company controls you. You, you know, the people who you owe, the creditors owe you. They, they, they own you. The credit card people own you. I mean, your whole life is controlled by people. And your greatest hope is that you'll be debt free. Talk to me, somebody. Anybody be debt free? Yes. And that's your dream? You know why you dream that? Because that's what your destiny is. Your past is debt free and your future is debt free. Why? You are not supposed to be indebted to anyone except to love them. And Christ said, that's the good news. The good news is what? The kingdom of God. What's the good news? The kingdom of God. What's the good news? I can't hear you. What is the good news? It's not the Baptist, the Anglican, the Methodist, the Catholic, the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, the Assemblies of God. It ain't none of that. The good news is the kingdom of God. And if anyone preach anything else other than the kingdom rulership of God, they are not preaching the gospel. Now we got off into all kinds of stuff in the church in the last three, I mean, 2,000 years or so. We just lost the thing. We're preaching all kinds of stuff. We're preaching, even born again has become the gospel. That, that's not the gospel. I mentioned to you last week, God only mentioned born again once. Jesus mentioned it once in the whole four gospel, only once, and never to a multitude, only to one man, an old man at night, three o'clock in the morning named Nicodemus. How come he preached born again as if it's the gospel? It's not the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is the kingdom of God. 
Why did he mention born again? Because the guy wanted to get into it. His question was, how do I get into the kingdom of God? Nicodemus was not interested in born again. He's interested in this kingdom thing. He said, I want to get into the kingdom. And Christ said, good. If you want to get into it, then you need a new spirit to come back inside of you. Why? It's a spirit that you lost. It's the Holy Spirit. Adam lost contact with heaven. That's why he didn't know how to rule earth. I repeat, Adam lost contact with heaven, didn't know how to rule earth. So the number one key to the kingdom of God is getting the Holy Spirit back into every human being. So he can be in touch with the unseen, so we can rule the seen. That's why the number one goal of Jesus Christ is to get the Holy Spirit back into every human being. That's why Joel 2 is so important. Joel says, I see the day coming when he shall put his spirit in all flesh. He got excited. He says, I see it upon the handmaidens. I see it upon the old men. I see it in the, in the young people. I see it in the, in the young men. He said, everybody going to get this thing back again. Wow, he got excited. And the last work of Jesus on, on this earth is very simple, isn't it? It's found in John 21. John 20, rather. He turns the disciples after resurrection and he holds them and he breathes in them and he says, Receive now the Holy Spirit. The purpose for the cross is to cleanse you so you can receive the Holy Spirit again. So the key to the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. That's why I love the song we sang this morning. Righteousness and peace and joy are where? In the Holy Ghost. And that's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Well, I think that's important to remember. Because the charismatic movement is going after meat and drink. Some of you, you know, I was driving here this morning, early this morning, I'm driving by myself to, 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 to the service, to my office, and, and the, the Lord just began to speak to me quietly, to myself again. He said, you know, it's not about prosperity. He said, prosperity, write this down, is a byproduct of the kingdom. It's not the goal of your life. Prosperity is a benefit of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. It should not be your focus. In other words, trying to get a big car and a big house and nice clothes and all this stuff. He says, you got your focus wrong. And we've made that the gospel. We said, you, you must be living right if you got a big car and a big house. That's not true. Because you got a big car and have no peace. Because you can't pay for it. Live in a big house and you have all kinds of houses because you can't keep the mortgage up. See, that's foolishness. No, the kingdom of God is what? Love, joy, and peace. We're in the Holy Ghost. And if you seek first this kingdom, then all these things come along with it. Can I hear an amen? Let me tell you some young people, you start in college, you go in into to your education. I'm telling you as a man of God who's been there, if you trust the kingdom of God, God will bring people into your life with all your money all your money is not in your parents it's not with them folks you left home your money is in people waiting for you right here in this country they were born to pay your tuition that's how the kingdom works Christ says if any man trusts me he will never ever be made ashamed let me tell you something if you've been made ashamed you can't pay your bill you better check your trust level help me Jesus we got to refocus ourselves on the kingdom. I was sharing with some of our directors last week. I said, you know something? We need to make sure as a leadership that we get focused on the kingdom and understand how it works. Because if we don't, you're going to end up trying to solve your own problems. You're going to have yourself a heart attack. Because you weren't born to carry the weight that God's supposed to pay for. Christ says, I came to do what? To preach the kingdom of God. For this reason, I came. That's an awesome statement. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God doesn't come with your careful observation. Luke 17, 20. But it says, no will people say, here it is or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is where? He said, it will be within you. The rulership of God begins within you. Why? It's by the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the reconnection of the kingdom of God. I want to read John 18. Turn to this one. This is very good. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. 
but now my kingdom is from another place I want us to pause here a minute this way we get deep what is happening here Jesus Christ is in a courtroom a makeshift courtroom this is late at night it's illegal trial because no one's supposed to be tried after sunset in the culture of the Roman uh, authorities but the Pharisees and scribes got a problem with this young 30 year old rabbi right now he's 33 years old actually 33 and a half years old and they upset at him because he's not a religious man and he's taken away all their members so they said we gotta stop this man before he corrupts all of Jerusalem with his teaching what teaching of the kingdom of God and let me say something very important here are you all listening of me Lord religion gets its pleasure from controlling people keep the TV on in other words re re religious people feel like they are successful when they control the people that follow them Jesus came preaching a message that gave the people freedom to determine their own destiny. I want you to understand how subtle this is psychologically. So when you begin to teach people that they don't need the priest anymore, <laughs> that they are a priest themselves, and that they can go direct to the high priest, that's a problem for religion. Sit up straight. See, religion loves to control people and the kingdom does the opposite it gives you authority over your own life it gives you responsible to determine your own destiny which means that religious people now can no longer control you think about it friends <laughs> If I get my job from you needing me to bring your sins to me, then you better have a lot of sins to keep me in business. I see you nodding your head. Some of you understanding it. That just went over some people's heads. See, see, you better keep sinning because I need a job. <laughs> but I come preaching a gospel that says you can confess your own sins and he is faithful and just to forgive you of your own sins you don't need me no more then I, I, I lose my job in other words sin is good business for some people but Jesus came oh man these religious leaders came to Jesus one day and they said we caught this woman man she's an adulterer man we caught her in the act i'm still trying to figure out where the man is anyhow that's the problem i got with them see religious people they <laughs> anyhow <laughs> hyper hypocrites so they brought the woman caught in adultery huh? and they said to jesus ah we got her we according to the law we have to stone her because the law for adultery says there must be capital punishment. That's stoning in those days. Capital punishment is stoning. They threw rocks until you were dead. Jesus said to them, Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, I'm going to write on the ground. I can't tell you what he wrote, but I got my, my hunch. I believe he started writing names and putting women names next to them. John, Mary, <laughs> Jeffrey, Susan. In other words, I know who you're sleeping with too. <laughs> Whatever he wrote, the Bible says they dropped their stones and they walked away from there. And the scripture says when he was finished, only he and the woman was there. He then turns to the woman and asks her, where are those who accuse you? And she said, they're gone, sir. And then he said, neither do I. Now that's heavy. Yeah. 
Do you know what the Pharisees and scribes really wanted? They wanted to go home that night saying, killed another one today. Yes, sir, them dirty sinners got another one today. I'd show them, don't fool around our religion. We'll kill you. What kind of attitude is that? They got their pride out of controlling people's lives and even killing them. But the kingdom of God brings mercy. It brings forgiveness. It brings restoration. He gave that woman her own power. Listen, he says, go and sin no more. Now, how can a woman do that before the cross? And there's your mystery. He was telling her, you don't need the Holy Ghost to live right. <laughs> You need the Holy Ghost to be back in touch with heaven. But you have the power to choose to do right, right now. Which of you done wrong couldn't, couldn't stop yourself? Stand up. Anyone here did wrong and couldn't stop yourself? Stand up. Even before you were saved. You done wrong and you couldn't stop yourself. Stand up. Come on, stand up. I'm not afraid. Stand up. See? All of you just like that woman. Go and sin no more. <laughs> well, we got to pray for this man. A according to you, Jesus lied to the woman. <laughs> Jesus knew that you and I got the willpower to do right. What we don't have is conviction. The Holy Spirit brings us conviction. He reminds us that we are in touch with God. Can I suggest to you, friends, that the kingdom of God gives you individual government? You know what the Bible says in the book of Gen Galatians 5? It says this, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, sounds familiar, it's a kingdom, eh? Self-control. Against these there is no law, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, patience. There's no law. In other words, when you understand this, if the kingdom of God works, the police will lose their need to be around. I like it the way Paul, Paul said to the, to the church in, in Galatia. He says, the greatest law in the whole Bible is to love the Lord and to love your neighbor yourself. He repeats the words of Jesus. And then he says, no man can say he loves his neighbor and then commit adultery with them against his, his wife or something. In other words, he's saying, look, all the problems in the world are related to the fact that we are not in the kingdom of God, not following the Holy Spirit, and that's why we got so much other laws in society. The kingdom of God brings peace in society, and it brings order in society, because people begin to govern themselves. The reason why uh, God doesn't send a pass and a check on you every day, all day. It's because he gave you the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to live right in secret. If you are governed by the citizenship of God. And that's why righteousness is, is a part of the kingdom of God. Because it means you stay in right standing with the, with the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to, to notice something here in this verse. He says, standing before Pilate, Pilate says to, to, to Jesus, he said, do you know I got the power to, to kill you or to give you your life back? Now, Jesus was quiet all during the trial. The reason why he was quiet is because they were not dealing with kingdom at the moment. They were not challenging his citizenship. Uh, he had no problem with what they were doing because as far as he's concerned, this is just a matter of, you know, this is pr pr procedure. But the only time he spoke was when Pilate challenged him with a kingdom challenge. Pilate said to him, do you know who I am? I have the power, don't use that word with Jesus. 
I have the power to condemn you to death or to give you life. Well, Jesus couldn't stay quiet any longer. So Christ decided to speak. He said, excuse me. And then he said these words right here. He says, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Because if my kingdom was of the world that you are part of, then my servants would come here and they would protect me and you couldn't arrest me. Now, this is in the book of, of John. In the book of Luke, he says the same thing in the same context, but he says this. He says, if my servants came, even now I could call ten legions of angels and they would take you out, Pilate. Now, a legion is a, is a whole lot of angels. They say between six to six thousand. Multiply that by ten. How much that is? Sixty thousand. Now, one angel could pour one veil on the earth and create a famine. Could you imagine sixty thousand showing up to take care of you? Two of them moved a stone that it took ten soldiers to move. One of them fought to get Daniel's prayer through. A whole network of demons. These are powerful people. Creatures, I should say. Jesus said, Pilate, you are lucky. <laughs> luck on your side. The, the luck is, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom, my government of this world, then I would call my servants. Write the word servants down, please. Very important word, servant. The word servants there is referring to soldiers, army. I would call my army and they would prevent my arrest, he says. Everybody say kingdom servants. Say it again. Now according to Jesus, the kingdom has its own army. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up, but don't, don't miss. This, this is going to change your life this week. <laughs> Jesus said the kingdom of God has an army that is not of this world, but it has an army. Oh dear. There's another verse before I explain that I want to show you. In verse 37, he says, Pilate asked him, Then are you a king? See, Pilate got nervous. Are you a king? What is king? A ruler? You have a domain, a, 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 a dominion over a domain. Are you a king? Jesus said, You're right. I am a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born. Okay, now we got two scriptures here that explains why he came. Number one, he came to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That's why he came. And secondly, he came to establish the fact that he is the king of that kingdom. Two reasons he came. And then he says here, and for this cause I came into the world to testify to the truth. What's the truth? That I am a king and there's a kingdom. The truth is, there's a kingdom and I am the king. That's the truth. And I came to testify. The word testify, I like the word testify. It's a legal word in the courtroom. And it means what? To test someone's confession. In other words, he says, I, I came to let you all test the kingdom to see how it works. Wow. Well, Pilate was testing the kingdom. And Christ says, okay, since you're testing kingdoms, let's test. If my kingdom was of this world, I would call my army the way you call your soldiers. This is practical. Pilate cannot fight Jesus. 
Pilate heard about him walking on the water, heard about this guy speaking to the wind and to the storms. I mean, this is news. Everybody knew about this. Matter of fact, Pilate and Herod wanted Jesus to do some stuff for them. Matter of fact, Herod asked a request, show me some, some tricks. They knew the guy had power. So Pilate wasn't going to deal with him by himself. What did Pilate say? Pilate says, I got authority to give you your life or take it from you. Why? I got a, I got a centurion and under him is 6,000 soldiers. And I got a whole army of Caesar behind me. I got the best army in the world behind me. If we were to give a command, they would come and wipe you out. Jesus, Jesus, let me talk about kingdoms. Now you, 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 you can get blessed in a minute. He says, look. He says, you talking about army? He said, you are so lucky, Pilate that my kingdom is not of this realm because if it was <laughs> then my servants would fight now who is okay I'm trying to explain this he was saying the <clears throat> the the disciples are not my soldiers write that down please it's very important see we think that the church is the army That's why we're getting so beat up. Religious people like to fight. Stay with me, girl. You're going to get blessed in a minute. I've been taught, and I used to believe until the Lord corrected me, that the church was the army. The church is not the army. Christ says, look, our kingdom... <laughs> Our government is not of this world. That's why we don't fight flesh and blood. Yeah. Friends, listen to me carefully. Uh, laboring all night in prayer, sweating and groaning, walking the floor all morning, wondering, you know, trying to get God to feel sorry for you, walking up and down. That don't get nothing done. What you doing? You fighting? You're fighting. Jesus said, look, your kingdom is not of this world. So my servants are not of this world. My servants, my soldiers, my army, those who protect and take care of me are not of this world. So Pilate, I don't want to deal with you because you at a different level you lower than me you all talk to me man see the reason why you have a good week this week because i'm going to elevate your mentality to your awareness of who are your protectors i'm going to give you your dignity back this morning i'm so important that i feel real important Write these statements down. Number one, kingdoms have citizens. And number two, citizens are not servants. And number three, citizens do not fight. The army fights. And number four, the army protects and defends the citizens. And number five, the army serves the citizens. And number six, who are the servants and the army of the kingdom of heaven? That's the big question. And that's a question that we need to get clear for an answer. We live in the Bahamas. Those of you from the United States, and those of you who are from Guyana and other countries, Jamaica and Barbados and England. Okay, many of your countries have armies. In the Bahamas, we got what we call the defense force. Everybody say defense force. They are what? The defense force. Who, do, who do, do they defend? They defend us. The policeman is the army of the Bahamas. They are the law enforcement agency. They enforce the law and protect the citizens. You all follow me, man? In America, you've got the army 
the, the, which consists of the Marines and, the, and the, the Navy and the military guys. And what are they there for? They are there to protect the citizens. Oh, Lord, help me with this. Citizens do not fight. <laughs> Citizens do not fight. Citizens are protected by the army. The army carries out the citizens bidding. Oh, help me now. If someone breaks into your house, do you know how much power you have? You got the power to pick up the telephone and make the policeman come to your house. You've got what? You've got citizen authority. Ah, somebody getting it slowly. All right. So the, when someone attacks your country, the citizens don't pick up rocks and bottles and conch shell. We go, no, no, no. They call for some other people. Who they call for? The army. The citizens never fight. Matter of fact, the citizens stay safe in their home while the armies are there fighting and killing for them. I'm going to get this in a minute. See, as long as you are the army, you're in the fight. But if you are a citizen, you relax and drink Kool-Aid. No, not some healthy. Apple juice. <laughs> you stay safe in the city. Why? The army is working for you. They are protecting you. They are defending you. So when you are a citizen, you don't worry. You let the generals worry. The kingdom of God is the most exciting thing to get a hold of because suddenly you stop fighting. Do you know what it is for you to pick up the phone and call an angel and say, look, I got some problems happening over here. No, I'll give, I'll give myself away. All right, sorry about that. See, <laughs> you're getting that, huh? See, we've been, the church is not an army. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know what a phone call is? A phone call is prayer. Prayer Prayers when you call the government and say, look, I got some conditions that I don't like around here. And the government then dispatches a whole regiment. <laughs> you all can get it after I'm gone. That's all right. So we've confused Ephesians 6 when Paul says to the church, he said, look, here's how we fight, Paul says. You put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the loincloth of truth, the shoe of the gospel, the shield of faith, and the sword of the word. Then he says what? Pray. You don't fight. You want Pray. He says, I'm praying without ceasing. I'm praying all kinds of prayer. Why? He said, because we don't fight against flesh and blood. When you pray, you are calling up the government. Some of you all need to call the government today. Citizens don't fight. I want to close on a couple of scriptures and we're going to come back to this next, next, next week. But look at this. It says the church is not the army. The church is the citizenry. Look at Ephesians 2, 19, verse 19 and 20. Consequently, Paul says, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Now, there are two words here I want you to underline. One is citizenship and household. Household, citizenship has to do with legal rights. You, have a, you are a legal citizen. But household means what? Family. Oh, man, this is deep. You see? <laughs> Oh, help me, Lord. I can't teach. Okay. The king is your king. So you are a citizen of the kingdom. But the problem is the king is also your brother. You all ain't got that. So Paul says, look, we covered twice. We covered legally and we covered blood-wise. Now talk to me. 
How I have a problem if my brother is the king? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2 says, He does not find it a shame to call us brothers. We are his brethren. Jesus is your big brother. Your big brother died to give you back authority in the kingdom. And therefore you have a citizen's rights, but you also have relationship with the king because that's your family. And then his father is your daddy. So I don't understand what your problem is. We should have no worry days, no depression, no ulcers, no heart trouble, no high blood pressure, no tuberculosis, no kind of ulcers, nothing. Why? Because if we understand kingdom, we walk out in the morning broke and smiling. Why? I'm broke. I just didn't get my money yet. <laughs> How many of you got money in the bank but ain't got it in your pocket? Let me see your hands. Get money bank. Yeah, see, you got money. People think you got no money. It's just in the bank account. That's how the kingdom works. The Bible says you store up your treasures in heaven where the inflation can't get to. So I, I look broke. Don't you let that fool you. When I ready to make a drawdown on my account, I go to a bank you can't see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Citizenship and household relationship. Repeat out to me. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. Say it again. I'm a citizen. Psalm 91 11 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Who are the army? The army is the angels. And they've been dispatched to guard you. And they will do what? Guard you and keep you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. That is not a devotional scripture. That is a government contract with the citizens. Oh my Lord, Pastor Richard, listen. When the devil came to Jesus, the devil knew that Jesus knew his citizen rights. So Satan could not try and snow him with religion. So Satan said to him, look, uh, jump from this place. He said, because you know what the rights are. The rights are if you jump from here, he has given the army. How does Satan know this? He used to be in the army. He says, I know how the army works. And the general said that if anyone was to... Now, oh my God, have mercy. This is heavy. Okay. Hallelujah. Why does Satan say to Jesus, the angel will keep him? Because Jesus was a man. He put on human flesh. And... Oh dear. See, in heaven, they don't take care of that. All of them is army in heaven. No, still ain't coming to the right. Okay. <laughs> if you are a human, they work for you. <laughs> he said, because you are a man, they have to protect you based on the law that you wrote. Satan was quoting scripture. But he misquote just one word. It says if you fall, not if you jump. <laughs> if you fall, he has given his angels charge. Charge means what? Responsibility. He's given the army to watch over my kids. You don't even get this till I'm gone. When you walk out here, believe me, friends, this message is attracting angels right now. When you walk over here, there can be some big guys walking behind. You can't see them. Big guys. They can walk by. They can trot behind your car. Just trot behind you. Just, just stay with you. Huh? If you're an ambassador, tell me about it, brother. Ambassadors got people to what? Show for. And they got what? They got a guy out front, a guy in the back. Guess what? You are an ambassador of Christ. When you leave here, there's a guy in the front of your car. Just clearing the way. A guy behind, watching. Make everything cool. Another guy on the side. Just going along. Another guy in the front, driving with the driver. You ain't got nothing to worry about if you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Yeah. 
stay neighbor I'm under responsible hands say neighbor nothing can happen to me today because I'm protected by secret servant agents lift your hands and shout for one second this is not a joke this is real this is kingdom business oh man oh quick 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 look at this psalm 78 49 says he unleashed against them his hot angels his anger his wrath indignation hostility what did he send out of it a band of destroying angels let me tell you god don't fight nobody well. now them same creatures <laughs> look at what they do he released his hot anger his wrath his indignation his hostility through a band of destroying angels yes. that's the army the church is supposed to be fighting. We're supposed to give orders. I tell the angels, every time I leave, I tell the angels, now you all stay by my house. Watch over my property. Watch over my children. Watch over my car. I'm going away. And I mean that. That ain't no, no, no little sheep is prayer. I know that's kingdom talk. Have you left angels in your house before you left home? You better point right now where it is and just tell them go. No matter where it is, it can be in America, it can be in Barbados, just send them home. Say, so you go and watch over. You've been given responsibility by the government to watch and guard me. It's kingdom talk. Oh, I got to get to this verse here. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, verse 20. You his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly what? Hosts for his servants. You are his servants who do his will. Talking about angels, man. Angels are here to do God's will for us. But look at the, this, this term host, eh? You read it all through the Bible. Host. Host is referring to army. God heavenly host is the army of heaven and they are what the Bible says they are there to serve him and to do his bidding but look at Hebrews 1 14 and this is the powerful verse I want you to get it says are not all angels how many all angels that includes Michael Gabriel and Lucifer mm -hmm. all angels are ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who will inherit salvation is that you if that you hold your hand up please tell your neighbor they were sent for it to serve me they are my servants they are my ministers they are my army they are my police they are my servants they are my military that's what the Bible calls them same word used they were sent for to serve you who are heirs of salvation that means you and I are citizens and citizens don't fight I think a great example Revelation 12 7 and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back Daniel 10 12 your words were heard the angel told Daniel the moment you prayed 21 days ago your words were heard and I have come to re in respond to them I've come in what in respond to your words who was praying a man who answered an angel but read the next statement it says but on my way the prince of Persia the kingdom uh, the Persian kingdom re resisted me 21 days then Michael showed up one of the chief princes and he came to help me because I was detained uh, there with this with the king of Persia in other words these angels they take care of business man my point is this Daniel was praying and then he waited no fight Daniel cool and the angel says the first day you prayed <laughs> let me tell you what blessed me with this we can, we, can, we can go now listen to this the answer is brought by angels oh dear <laughs> angels can talk to the man who waking in the bank who holding up your loan 
but you got to pray to the government. Don't, don't talk to the man. Talk to the government and then go to the bank. <laughs> now, sometimes you go the first time, the angel ain't reach yet because it may be a little bit fighting going on. You go back the second time, the third time, the fourth time, 21 times. <laughs> and then the fellow said, you know, I don't know why I was holding this up for you. Well, I know why. Michael came in and fixed things a little bit. My point is this. Whenever you pray, God dispatches the army to take care of your business. This is incredible for citizenship. And that's why we as a people need to stop thinking in terms of us being the army. And we got to understand that we have a destiny in the kingdom of God. Let me close with this verse. Matthew 24, 25, 24, 34. Come you are blessed of my father, take your inheritance which is the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Jesus said you were created to inherit the kingdom. It's yours from the beginning. It's what you were born to have. It was always yours. Jesus, when he finished his test in the wilderness, do you remember what he did? The Bible says that after he had left fasted 40 days and 40 nights, Satan came and tempted him. And he quoted the law back to Satan and he warned and what happened? The Bible says, and then angels came and ministered to him. And this, this, this has been bugging me a little bit lately. What does that mean? What, is, what does that mean? Okay. To minister means what? To serve. They came and served him. They were soldiers. They came to serve him. Take care of him. He is a citizen. Well, what did he need? Can anyone tell me? Food. What else? He need water. Shade. Yeah, he needed a bath. Probably need some, some lotion because it's dry out there. In other words, these angels came, <laughs> probably ran the devil far away, and came back and washed his face, found him food, rubbed his foot, massaged his back, put lotion on. I don't know what they did, but it just simply said they ministered to him. Some of you need some ministry this morning. And I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're tired, fighting all this battle. You've been trying to fix things yourself. And God is saying, will you just relax this morning? Because I'm going to send some of the servants into the service. And they're going to go about and they're going to just minister to you. Because that's their job. Yes. Citizens do not fight. Citizens are protected and preserved by the army. The kingdom of God is therefore the most exciting place to live because suddenly you stop worrying. Today, angels are going about doing work for you if you call the government. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.